and welcome to our fourth instalment of uh, Unleash the Beast, the story of an old 23-foot Bertram Diggs, which we um, which we took the stern drive out from, put a pole on the back, and then a big outboard engine. Yes, if you've been following along, this is actually a project we did on our fishing show hook, line, and sinker, sort of uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, yep. in actual fact. So it was a boat that we bought. We paid 30 grand. If you haven't seen the uh, uh, you know the first three instalments of this feel free to go back and have a look at those probably a good um, idea it helps to bring you in at the right point because at yeah. this stage um, a lot of the heavy lifting in this project has been done a lot of the glass work and that sort of stuff which is where if you're going to do this you will spend a lot of time money and effort yes indeed so the boat at the moment uh, is ready for its engine yeah just before we get to that um, the response to those Couple of videos. Yeah, it's been very it's positive. Been it's Thank been you interesting. for watching. Yeah. Um, remember to tell your mates about us and subscribe sort and sort of follow us. Far and wide, we're getting a yeah. bit of an audience in the state, which states which is very new for us. We've never been there. Um, Apparently, you know, it's a big thing. It's over a there. thing there. Yep. So you imagine how many sports cruises yes. and stuff have been sold in the United States in the last twenty years, um, all typically with big um, stern drive, drives, them, two yeah. of them, yep, um, or more. Uh, and you know, doing this, clipping a couple of outboards to the back um, gives them another, you know, 20 years life. So, yep. um, yeah. A couple of good questions have come in. Yeah. One is about weight distribution. And I think it's an excellent question because we take the original boat, yep. we, we tinker with it. We pull out a very, very heavy engine. We add fiberglass pod and we add another outboard engine. Where does it leave us? How does the boat sit? How does it perform? Look, as we have alluded to in um, previous videos, the particularly the decision to pod, yes, um, because that exacerbates the weight distribution change. So yep. this boat, this boat that we're in now, which isn't the beast, but um, is a similar sort of thing, has a stern drive sitting in, in the boat, which is essentially 500 kilos, yep. uh, half a ton, down there low on the keel line in the center of the boat. Um, then you take that out, which obviously changes very substantially the way the boat sits on its lines. You yes, add a does. pod, which depending on what so sort of pod or outboard bracket you add, which may add more buoyancy to the back of the boat. Then you clip an outboard on to the back of that, which is uh, a lot of weight further aft and weight further up. Now, on the surface of that, you would say that is potentially a disaster. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, particularly, say, in Beast, which was a 23-foot boat, not a massive boat, a big trailer yep. boat, but, um, you know, and the V8 engine was for an outboard, and particularly at the time, a big, uh, what did it weigh, 300, I think 350, something yep. like that, 350 kilos. So you're putting a fair bit of weight up high. Um, we got a, a, a nav arc to we do did. that to do the sums on that and, and you know getting a little bit ahead of ourselves it was sweet never noticed it like we've done it to other boats yes and um, you do notice this boat included and you know you do notice it and then you need to try and quickly fix it which yeah. is never a good thing um we'll get to that in later series but um but beast as soon as we put her in the water she sat on where her she marks, was meant yeah. to sit. Um, but she wasn't tender when you hopped on her. No, um, no, so and, and never felt, you know, and again, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but never felt funny or weird no. or anything. But make no mistake, if you are gonna do something like this, you will substantially alter your um, center of gravity, oh. your your um, moment of weight and all those sorts of things. Yeah. And there does exist the opportunity to wreck it. It's a different sort of story, I think, if, you, if you're gonna transom mount. And look, I think that's probably the safest way to go. Yeah. Um, the reason, say, in this boat we haven't transom mounted is because it gives you so much more room. If you've got to hang the outboards on the transom, then you've got to give them enough room to tilt back into yeah. the boat. Yeah. So you lose, you know, a metre and a half of cockpit space because the, the engine's got to be able to tilt back, you know, any cutting boards or, or that sort of stuff got to be up high or back or something. So a pod gives you the most bang for buck, but it also gives you easily the most risk of wrecking your boat. Very good. Um, now, we are... Was the there most... another question you wanted to... No, that was... You're happy with two that. Questions. Okay. Really good answer. Yeah. Yeah. Weight distribution. <laughs> um, 
We are to the point now in the series, in our in-depth look at the beast, yep. uh, where we're going to bolt the engine off. Yeah, it was an exciting day. We were very, very excited. I want you to um, remember that this is 10 years old, 11 yep. years old, so um, you'll hear us talking about uh, plug and play and the ease of fitting up. And no doubt, this is a game changer for outboards now. You know, if you see yep. American boats with four of them clipped on the back and all this sort of stuff, it's really simple to just run the wiring up to the helm and plug them in and they go. Um, you know, obviously to do that with stern drives, there's cables and things yep. and um, elbows and little trim pumps and all that sort of stuff that have yeah, to go you'll in see there. in this yeah. next little bit how much uh, wire and bits and pieces we actually pulled out uh, that we didn't pull out in yeah. our initial stripping down and that the boys at the marine shop pulled out. Yeah, yeah. It's scary compared to what now goes back in. The time has come now for the heart transplant to whack on the back of the beast the mighty Yamaha F350 V8 four-stroke. Radio folks, this is now getting exciting. This is nearing completion. I'm joined by Huey Lewis from Lewis Marine. Mate, welcome to Project 350 Unleash the yeah, Beast, firstly. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this project. It's going to be very exciting. Well, it is, mate. Now, we've brought it to you because you're the local Yamaha dealer and you're going to stick the engine on the back for us. We are, Nick, aren't we? Hugh, I'm very excited and most excited about this because Here it in is. this enormous box is not ah. just any. Wow, look at that. 350 V8, but hook, line and sinker's very own. Hugh, tell us a little bit about this thing. <laughs> look, mate, these are 5.3 litre V8, bigger than a V8 supercar engine, and it's going on the back of that <laughs> boat. It is going to be awesome. What sort of performance would you expect from Beast with this in situ? I would expect this boat will do very close to 50 mile an hour with this engine. Yeah. A lot yeah. faster than any other Caribbean 23 or anything. Yeah. It's going right. to be fast. We're in the workshops of Lewis Marine where, well, Andrew, we thought we had stripped the beast out, but clearly <laughs> not quite everything. We thought we'd done it, but these boys took another few days to do it <laughs> properly. Look at all this garbage. This is what came out of it. Wires, cables, all manner of junk. On this side, Nick, our new stuff that goes in yeah. is all laid out nicely. That basically is a nightmare, and that's yeah. how it used to be done. But now there is a better way, thanks to Yamaha. And this is it. This is everything that we need to plug and play to get our big Yamaha going. The controls, well, they're fly-by-wire, so there's no big heavy cables to adjust. There's nothing like that. There's two sets because, Nick, we've got the upstairs flybridge and the downstairs helm station. Indeed, Andrew. This is a very, very you know, large yes. and impressive craft, obviously. And, and while that is all nice to look at, the cables and the control boxes, it's becoming time where we can actually see what our enormous big motor will look like on the back of the beast. It's kind of mock fit up day, and that's very exciting. It doesn't look ridiculous at all. It does not, that's the great thing. We thought that maybe the kind of 350 might overshadow the beast, make yeah. it look like a sort of pimple on a pumpkin, <laughs> but it looks pretty good. It looks kind of like it was designed to be there. It's really good. The other thing I really like about what they do these days here at Lewis Marine, in the old days you had cables and stuff coming out here and it was all sealed up with a yep. tennis ball, hopeless. This nice and neat, nothing sort of extraneous hanging off. And you'd think, Hardy, that we'd be getting close to going boating, but there's still a bit to be done. We're very close, Nick, but there's the fiddly things to be done. The things that we could do, but mm, we're a bit hopeless at, so we're gonna get Lewis Maroon to do them for us. Yep, it's decision time. You've got to work out where exactly you're going to put all your new super duper electronic gear. This is a stereo. We're going to flush mount the stereo along with the other boat radios. Uh, sounders, you need to work out exactly where you're going to put your sounder. For example, if you put it here, when you're driving your boat, you might not be able to see where you're going. If you put it here, this pole's going to be in the way, so there's big decisions to make. It's getting exciting, folks. It's getting very, very close, because next time you see Beast, well, it's time for her sea trials. We're going to put her in the water and just see exactly what this big V8 can do. Yeah, so the boat was at our local uh, outboard dealer, Yamaha dealer, for a few weeks, wasn't it? Yeah, probably a couple of weeks, as we'd left um, them to do 
I think the Mine's majority good. of yeah. the fit up, we did a, a few little jobs subsequent to that, but basically it came out of the shed ready to go. Yeah. And, you know, as we sort of touched on earlier, it was the first time, I think I'm right in saying, yeah. that we had, you know, fly-by-wire throttle. If you haven't used a fly-by-wire throttle, it is an intri- just because you get so used to the way the cable throttle feels and yeah. how the boat's going to react. And every single person who's ever... Um, for the first day or two days gets on the wheel of a thr- fly by wire throttle almost or sometimes does yes. tip everybody who's in yeah. the boat yeah, they the do boat. this so they you know you say just just be so gentle so yeah. gentle and this doesn't happen much anymore because people are used to it yeah but, you know for the last decade just so gentle with it so gentle with it. oh god oh, yeah. Jeez, camera's out the back and oh no you're gentle with it <laughs> Yeah, because yes. I think maybe the first part feels the same, and then after that it just comes on with a massive rush. But no, it is everything is digital, and you know we we had for the first time the big colour yeah. LCD screens that told us everything. You know, before that it was the sort of little gauges. Now we've, we're into sort of bigger screens. And probably the thing, and I know this stuff was available before that, but um, you know your fuel monitoring becomes yeah. more central to your kind of boating experience because all that, as you say, information is available. So you get with real accuracy to see where the boat's at its happiest, where it's yeah. most fuel efficient. You know, if you're a bit of a bit of a tight fist like me, Andrew, you're driving around at uh, 3,400 RPM, just sipping on the fuel. Yes. Uh, and saying that you're 1. not allowed 6 to drive. 1.6 kilometres per litre, they'll right. tell you. Yeah, Whereas yeah. I'm driving it at 0.8 kilometre per litre, much quicker. Um, but no, and look, we're going over stuff that has been out for uh, more than a decade yep. now. But, and we touched on this before, everything evolves from this. So, yeah. you know, now we've got Yamaha's 425s and we've got Helm Master, which goes on on the the smaller outboards as well. Yep. You know that started with the four two fives, and it's completely it's digital steering yep. and joystick and yep. GPS, yep. and just you know it's going to change boating again as this as the as the three fifty did back in the day. Dynamic, what is it? Dynamic positioning systems, basically. What yeah. is, you know what ships have on yeah. it. You know you can just nudge that way, nudge that way. Yeah. yeah. So um, it is interesting to see all this sort of stuff coming through, and at the time it comes through, you think. Oh, well, this might be a little bit over the top. Who's going to pay um, to have that added bit of functionality? Sort of turns out that everybody <laughs> will pay to have that. <laughs> Boat owners, as you're only too well aware, are um, keen to cop up for all the bling. It's, so, uh, it's a long wait at the moment to get a Hellmaster. Which yeah, just yeah. Shows you. They've only just come out, you know, yeah. the, the best part of 18,000 Australian dollars. Yeah. It was like, jeez, are people really yes. going to pay to retrofit that? Um, turns out they are. So as you say, the boat spent two weeks or thereabouts getting fitted up and, you know, in between other jobs that they had to do. And the, yep. the, the day I think we went to pick it up and we did have representatives from Yamaha to come down yes. and have a look at it, but it was a foul, yes. foul uh, winter's day in Tasmania. It was toward winter, which is always a problem with us. Whenever we do a project boat, we start in summer and we finish it in winter. Um, which is a pain in the neck. But yeah, we didn't shoot the first day because it was literally too rough, but we did. We were so excited that we did put the water, uh, the boat in the water yep. in the Derwent River. Yep. Um, and look, I, I just remember that it, we, it was fast. Yes. Um, it felt it really fast. It was epically fast. It yep. obviously overpowered. Yes. Um, you know, a 250 would be ample on a 23-foot Birkham Flybridge, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, but there is something very, very uh, nice and reassuring about a boat that responds to the throttle like that. Yeah, um, you know. and it was also, the, I don't know if it was the first time we'd ever been uh, on a boat with a V8, um, yeah. but just, they, they actually have a roar to them as well. They, they had a they roar to them. Sound, and, um, sounded good. It didn't, yeah. didn't sound, you know, like your sort of Australian slash American muscle car so much, but no. it... It sounded very, very nice. Um, it was willing to rev, sound like it wanted to rev. Um, yeah. You know, people make the point that it was a very expensive exercise to do that, you know, yeah. in terms of financial. So you pay 30 grand for the boat, then yes. you spend another 15, 20,000 doing it up. So then you're at, uh, what, 50, and then you spend four, that engine itself was over 40,000. Yeah, and then so then you're at 90, so really it's cheaper. And look, they make a good point. Yeah. It doesn't make financial no. sense to do this. You um, know. But 
Jesus gives you a good boat. Well, well, we'll do the numbers so we, we we can show you absolutely empirically what sort of fuel saving you get, what sort of uh, noise um, yeah. reduction you get, and those things are good. But what that probably doesn't illustrate, and what you're actually getting for your money, yep. is the turn keyness of your boat. You yes. know, like when when your stern drive gets to be 20 years old yes. and older. Um, unless you are very, very, very diligent with your maintenance and a good operator yourself, yeah. it will be a bit, a bit turnkey, but, it, you know, there are... You will things. crash it in a tight spot in marina because your motor will stop and yeah. then you'll be drifting to then you'll be yelling and, you'll be, and your wife will be yelling at you and, yeah. and other people will be yelling and then you'll just sort of bump into another boat. Whereas yeah. um, by putting on a new four-stroke like this, you know, it's like driving around in a modern day car pretty much it just goes you turn the key and it goes and it, it you know so it's it's an option for um people with old stern drives also really um you know if you've got an old um traditional sort of carbureted or injected two-stroke outboard yeah. you know which are pretty yeah. ropey these yeah. days um and burn a mountain of gas um you know you get bang for your buck there. Yeah. The longer you keep your boat, yeah. so the longer you have your project boat, uh, you know, we get discounts for doing this obviously from, you know, fiberglass shops and stuff like that. So we generally don't pay retail, maybe half we would pay retail, but even us paying half for yeah. everything typically wouldn't be able to sell the boats, flip the boats for a profit. No, I don't think we've ever made a profit on one. If we're getting our money back yeah. with that big discount, that's yeah. okay. But as you said, if you're, if you're going to keep the boat, yeah. um, you've got basically, I know it's not a new boat, no. but it's basically a new boat. You know, you've done the hull, you've done the integrity of, of doing the transom and yep. the stringers and the floor, and you know you know that the boat's going to be good for another 20 or 30 yep. years. And, and if you look at the price of a new boat, um, then all of a sudden it, it does. It starts to make sense. To make so sense. if we've tipped in 100 grand into the beast, um, when you start shopping around for a new boat that has the new engine, and, and as you say, the, the structural integrity of the boat that we've just done up, um, 100 grand starts to look okay. It does. Yeah. Anyway, it is now time to put the boat on the water and do sea trials. So this was all about um, taking the numbers. So we did the we did the numbers when it had the stern drive yep. in it. You know, every 500 RPM. It was actually one every every 100 RPM. Right. We, did. we really did the numbers we back really in the day. Did. Yeah. So we would record um, noise level. We would record fuel burn and yep. speed. Yeah. Uh, we also had a little box that did acceleration. So. You know, we had all the fang dangled technology. Some people did pick up in a previous video that we did um, some of the noise readings from the stern drive with the engine box open. Um, I can promise you hand on heart that we actually did do them properly from the start with yeah. the engine box closed. Um, so the numbers are good. So happy to stand by the numbers. The numbers are good. Um, yeah. And I think probably next time around we'll, we'll delve into those. We will, yeah. We'll, we'll just uh, we'll hold off those for a bit because, well, first of all, you're going to see what happened on Sea Trials Day. The moment of truth has arrived. We have developed the beast, spent an inordinate amount of time, yes. money and effort into building this boat. But today is the time where we find out how it goes. We love it. We yep. think it's a pretty good Thing, but we've got the big guns from Yamaha down here with all their scientific equipment, Nick, to see if the figures actually stack up. That's right, mate. We need to quantify yes. how the beast goes now as opposed to how it did in its original guise. Correct. This is, as we have mentioned, the moment of truth. All right, the man that is going to perform our test is Glenn Gibson from Yamaha, mate. Welcome back to Unleash the Beast. Thanks for having us here. When you saw this boat last time, it was before we'd done any work to it whatsoever. Are you surprised? I did not think this was possible. <laughs> I mean, have a go at it. The room where the engine used to be, yep. the outboards out there, we've got all this cockpit space. Awesome, awesome. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the beast, which has been good. A lot of people are sort of wondering how it's going to perform with the big V8 Yamaha on the back of it. Today, we're going to actually find out. 
Yeah, first of all, we're going to take some measurements of litres per hour over kilometres per hour. Yep. We're also going to do some decibel readings to see which one's quieter. And then finally, we're going to do an acceleration graph, which will give us speed over time, and it'll show us which one performs the best. So we did the exact same tests with the old engine that was in it? Yes, exactly the same. We're going to compare the two. We'll find out in an hour. So there's also some clever stuff that we'll show you. Uh, we've got the engine talking to our, to our sonar and GPS units. Uh, let's get started, mate. Let's get testing. Excellent. Can't wait. Decibels. 85. Right, okay. Ninety-five point one. All right, just deep in the heart of our testing session. While all this stuff kind of looks sort of technical, then and not generally what most people would do. The thing about these new Yamaha uh, four-stroke fuel-injected outboards is that they generate all this information anyway, whether you choose to look at it or not. That's right, through NMEA 2000, we yep. have the ability now to network into our multi-hubs and yep. into the sounder equipment, which on this boat, we've got the HDS7 on the downstairs station and upstairs. Yep. So we have a full instrumentation on the, on the depth sounder, which gives us all the information and it's without running a wire down to the engine. It's all generated from what is already behind the dash. Now, the beauty of this, you might think, oh yeah, but I don't want to have a 350 horsepower outboard, but you do not need it. No, no, from now it is available from the F30F, so yep. the four stroke 30 horsepower, right through to our biggest of the, of the range, the V8 F350. So if you've got a little tinny with a 30, a fuel injected 30 Yamaha and a, a, low, a low round sounder, for example, all this data, is available to you free of charge. It's uh, it's boating for the new millennium, Glenn, isn't it? Oh, that's right. Yeah. 56! 4,000 revs at about 60 kilometres an hour. Now, I remember when we first launched Beast with our inboard inner, and I did a similar thing, and this was the result. did go all right but I don't think she goes as well as it does now with the Yamaha V8 on the back. This is unbelievable. You could literally be on the phone sitting right here having a conversation. It's uh, it's an amazing bit of technology. All right, I've just uh, jumped off, beached onto our camera boat for the day, which is the Whitley. Uh, one of the tests that we've got to do is an acceleration test. There's a computer on board with an aerial and it will give us in the graphical format how quickly she accelerates and we can compare her to the beast of old. So, go! And go! It looks like she accelerates quite quickly to me. about the beast is because it's an older boat, almost 20 years old, it's a heavy boat, it weighs three tonnes. And in a situation like this where we've got wind against tide and sort of half a metre of shop, it's quite unpleasant. The beast just powers straight through it. Uh, yeah, whatever. It just goes straight through the sea instead of bouncing up and down over the top of it. No substitute for weight.
Okay, sea trials was a success. We knew yep. that we had on our hands a very hot, a very fast boat. Um, but now it was time to sort of see how she she did what she was built for, and that was to take her fishing. In some ways, she lulled us a little bit into a false sense of security because that boat went into the water, sat on its lines yep. like it did, and really didn't feel any different at all, um, you know, in terms of its stability or, yep. or, or how it um, handled, that we thought, oh, well, this is a walk in the park. You know, potting a boat, I don't know what all the fuss was about. Yep. You know, it really did feel that good. It was... Uh, it was perfect, was it? It was. Right? No, it was good. The, the problem I found with it <laughs> was that I drove it too fast. Yeah. Um, because the engine's so quiet and had so much power. power. Yeah. And it's like you're cruising along and you hit a bit of a sea and you're yeah, sort of on, going, what's wrong oh, with this what thing? is going on with this? And then you look 32 at 32 knots. Yeah, you look at your, <laughs> you look at your that's right. And so if you back it off to 22 knots, <laughs> yeah. you're back just sort of sipping on your cup yeah, of Yeah, you know, um, it was slow. So it took a bit to get used to. But, <laughs> but then, you know, if you wanted to do 50 knots, um, yep. You could. It's 50 knots, I promise you, is fast. <laughs> In the little yeah. firebridge there. Um, you know, people often talk about fast boats. 50 knots, I reckon, is the... Um, is the delineation when you were in a fast boat. If yeah. your boat will do 50, yep. um, they crack along. She did 50, but the first time we ever took a fishing uh, was in the middle, middle, middle of winter um, in Tasmania. We yep. thought we'd go down to uh, a place called Eagle Hook Neck, Tasman Peninsula, where you can sort of sometimes catch, well, you can often catch tuna and other bits and pieces. Yep. The fishing wasn't a great success. It was terrible. Uh, <laughs> terrible. Which is nothing new for us. No. Um, but the boat, I think, was a success. And here's a, a little look at what happened when we took her fishing for the first time offshore. Well, yeah, so the first part of our plan to test out the beast's fishing capabilities is to have a trial. Both Nick and myself love game fishing. We love trialing. And that's one of the reasons we went for a big Bertram 23 footer. And so far, so good. We've put the lines out, we've set the spread, and it, it is working perfectly. It actually came with these outrigger poles on it when we bought it, and uh, they're a great feature because they get your lures out into the clear water, and you can run more rods. So we're running five rods around the bottom of Tasmania, trying to catch a tuna to christen the beast. I'm on, it didn't oh, take long. Joking. We've got, a, we've got a fish on. And bites, I haven't hooked up. On the beast, Nick, on the beast. And uh, it's quite deep, it's sort of 55, 60 metres deep. We're fishing yep. for the Tasmanian trumpeter or the striped trumpeter. Yes. Which we're absolute <coughs> goops at. Uh, never really caught them much. No. Other than um, on charter boats. You kind of need to be in the right spot for Tassie trumpeter a little bit. We're in there. Tassie. Well, that's true yeah. enough. Now, we're talking about the beast as a fishing boat, and I guess the first thing you'll notice is the, the cockpit space is pretty much huge. Nice. For a 23-foot boat, it has got a big cockpit, four, five anglers in here, no drama whatsoever. Yep. Another kind of you know thing that we've done to modern it up is tie, under tow tie rails in the standard boat. That oh! goes all the way there. What have you got? Beast's first fish. They can't come aboard. Back, back it goes. Back, back, back. <laughs> we can't christen it with that. We can't christen it with it that. It hasn't touched the boat yet, so it's not counted. No, it got off. Hey, well, you're on. I'm on. Beast, it's just a fish razor. This feels maybe a little better than that horrid red thing that you caught. Yeah. Other good thing about the, um, the newly refurbished Beast fishing cockpit are these... Um, gun bolsters so you can lean up, you can hook in. And it's quite comfortable, nice, you know, it's kind of a modern touch. Oh, I don't know what this is. Okay. Yes. Yes? Don't bring it aboard. No. Is it a good fish? Uh, no. But it's a fish. Oh, it's a... Flathead. Can a we christen flathead? Uh, permission to bring it aboard or not? Can we christen beast with a flathead? Uh, 
uh, given current fishing opportunities, yes. Based is Chris and we'll probably with Danny on the board. Oh, Beast has got a fish. A fish on board. Look at that. Well done, Hardy. <laughs> Outstanding. She's a great fishing boat, a great fish raiser. Oh, look at that. Now, I guess a big part of uh, talking about the beast and whether it's any good as a fishing boat or not is actually how the thing performs out here in the water. As we've mentioned, this is the first time we've actually had this boat in sea water. We've had it in a river and stuff, and we know that it goes fast. It does every bit of 50 knots, but kind of that's not all that relevant when you're at sea most of the time. The sea state will uh, dictate that you can't do anywhere near that. And so kind of more interest is how it actually performs on the plane and how slowly you can go in some instances. This is her going up onto the plane. You can see the trim is very good, doesn't raise its nose at all. Up onto the plane and that's a sort of slow, heavy weather cruise at about 3,000 RPM, 18 knots. The thing, the boat, feels rock solid. It feels like a real truck and um, they've done a great job getting the dynamics of it. Absolutely spot on, it just goes very nice. Yes, there you go, the fishing uh, today. Best can't... described as diabolical. <laughs> yes, yes, it wasn't sensational. No. But the beast? Yes. Sensational. Absolutely sensational, yes. Hardy. Goes really well. The boat, uh, you know, at sea, it's a great sea boat. Oh, it goes like a train. It's one of the softest riding hulls I've actually ever been in, I guess because it's so old and heavy. Yep. They don't build boats like this anymore. But uh, no, first class. Looking forward to when the weather warms up and the fish turn up so we can put it through its paces properly. Exactly right. And all the fishing features that you yeah. have cleverly designed designed oh. and incorporated into this boat seem to work really well. Everything works beautiful. It's a good ship. Uh, another time that we did use it and actually had a, a little bit more success catching fish yeah. uh, was a little bit further up the coast, deep dropping over the continent. Yeah, so continent that we do. To Neville Shelf and this was, um, this was something, electric reels just sort of getting going back in the day yeah. and um, we thought, well, this is a perfect boat, perfect opportunity to head out offshore and give it a go and try and catch some ooglies from the deep, some good eating fish. That is very, very good. She performed pretty well there. I, mean, I do remember sitting up in the flybridge and there was a bit of a roll that day and um, yeah, this is a good boat. The, the, the real shame and the, the reason we don't have uh, mountains of stuff to show yeah. you about um, us fishing and using Beast in her um, finished condition was the fact that we sort of had to sell it to stop going from going broke. Yeah, it was very, it was the early days of our show and it was a big outlay. Yes, it was. Um, a big outlay. So we did, we sold it quickly, uh, which was a bit of a shame. We never really got to use it and, and catch decent fish out of it. Um, but what we did do mm -hmm. was contact the new owner yeah. sort of eight years later. Yes, um, yes. And that is worth looking at, I reckon we make that the next episode, the next instalment, where we, we come back to the beast 10 years on. Because interesting, always I reckon interesting to look at um, anything homemade, yes. homemade, you know, projecty, a little bit down the track, you know, how it's aged. Did the pod fall off it, Did the example? pod fall off it? Yes. It was a question we yes. would often get asked. Is um, there a great big crack through the hole? We will also uh, then unveil the numbers to try yep. and help, um, you know, further the economic case for um, doing yeah. a, a job like that to you. The boat. numbers are in fact hidden in our YouTube channel oh, yeah. back from yesteryear, but we'll redo them and do them better. Um, Good on us. We won't fudge them. Good we'll, on us, uh, no, no, no. We'll redo them with better graphics and stuff uh, because you actually stood in front of a, a green screen and did the numbers back, back in the day. Yep. In the newsroom. Yep. Um, so look, hopefully you're enjoying it. We've got mountains of this stuff. Some of the, um, some of the fashions through the course yeah. of the beast. I mean, I think in some of the sunglasses. <laughs> in hindsight, you know, I was uh, I was confused, keen to explore <laughs> the world of fashion a little bit more than you probably were, which uh, look reflects well on you. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, um, but look, we do have mountains of this. The next one we do will be. Yep. Can you believe? Beast two, but um, and that's a totally different project altogether. We yes. go twins instead of single yes. outboards, 
We have an alloy pot instead of a fiberglass pot. We have a massive problem <laughs> instead of it all going well. Um, so yeah, keep tuning in. If you're enjoying these, please um, feel free to hit the subscribe button, like, share, all of that stuff. Um, we're having good fun revisiting it as well. We so see you next time.